I'm in a series called We Believe, and the part that I'm talking about today is that we believe in the church, this idea called the church. I believe that we're in a day and age where even the church itself, the concept of the church is under attack. There are some who have claimed that we're in the post-church age, that the church is irrelevant for today, that the things which used to happen in years gone by was good for them, and it was good for the times during the Bible but there is no need for the church today. That is the local church. And I would say that the church is a plan of God. It's God's idea. It's God's establishment. It's God's creation. I believe in the church. I believe that the church is for today. I do not believe we're in the post-church age. I do not believe we're in a time where we no longer need to, to identify ourselves in local assemblies and that the church of God has a plan and has a mission that we are to carry out in today's society. As I talk about the church, I think back to when I was young. I didn't grow up in my initial years going to church. My parents were not believers. And then around the age of six or seven, my parents started taking us to church. They got saved. They started to attend church. And it was from about the age of seven on that church became a very important part of my life. Some of my best memories are associated with the church. I went to the Christian school in the church, so I was there six days a week. And so there are a few memories which are not good memories, although were important for my uh, formation as a pastor. But with that said, church was very, very important to me, even in my earliest years. And it was when I was about eight years old that I felt God leading me to be a pastor. And so I've always had this great desire to be a part of the church and to see the church prosper. Unfortunately, today, there are many churches which are not prospering. They are not doing well. Last week, I was reading through the, uh, the book. Ah, I can't remember the, uh, the book. Uh, we Are the Church. And uh, talked about the importance of the church and how that many are in decline. And many people do not see the need for church and how many people who grew up in church no longer attend. Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. I think one of the major reasons is that church has lost its relevance and that some churches have swerved away from standing on the authority of Scripture. Well, we believe in the church. So I want to read to you a, a statement from our doctrine. It says this, We believe the church of Jesus Christ began at Pentecost. So it had its beginning. It wasn't during the life of Jesus. It was after the life of Christ that the church was formed. It was born at Pentecost. We don't have time to go into all of that, but that's when it began. In Acts chapter 2, we can read about that. And in fact, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 in a little, a little bit. goes on to say, and, and the body and bride of Christ, a spiritual organism made up of all born-again persons of this present age. We also believe in a local church as defined in the New Testament scriptures. And so I have a number of scriptures I want to read through. The references are there in your notes if you'd like to, to look them up and follow along. The first one is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And by the way, these aren't all the verses that we would use if we were going to build a doctrine of the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Jesus is the head of the body, the church. And so in this instance, we're talking about the spiritual church not the local church, although the book of Ephesians does talk about the local church and its identity. The second passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 12 through 14. There are parallel passages to 1 Corinthians 
where it talks about how we are to function within the body, how that we all have gifts, and how that we can serve God. It says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. And so there's this identification of the church of Christ being not just one entity, but many entities, which makes up one large identification. The next passage is 1 Timothy chapter 3, and this talks about the leadership of the church. Not that long ago, I completed uh, some, some studies. A lot of them had to do with the authority of Scripture, how that many of, many of our churches have gone away from the authority of Scripture. One of the ways I feel like we've gone away from it is this idea of leadership within the church and actually qualified leadership. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13 says this, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless." Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. The third passage that I want to look to by way of introduction is Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. Again, these are all found in our doctrinal statement. It reads this way, Paul says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm uh, the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silent since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. So that's a mouthful. Who thinks that it'd be good if I preached through all of those things today? Is it possible? Uh, actually, it's impossible, and I, I'm not going to attempt to do that. What I want to do is back away from this passage, not back away from it, but get a look from a further distance and talk about some of the things involved with the church. The question is this, is what is a church? And we just read through some verses which described it and talked about elements of the church. What I want to do is go through and point out to you elements of the church. Before I do that, I want to point out two aspects of the church. The first aspect of the church is that it, there is a spiritual church, and that is all believers together make up the church of God. It is not a building. It is a group of people who are identified because they're born-again Christians. And those born-again believers make up the larger um, ball, I guess so you could, so to speak, and there are smaller manifestations, which I would call local churches. So let's think of the church like a basketball. If you were to look at a basketball, it's got a lot of little bumps on it. At least most basketballs do. Well, if you would liken that to the church, the church is the basketball, and the little bumps are the manifestations of the local churches. 
Now, you can be a part of the universal church and not be a part of a local church, but you cannot be a part of the local church, truly a part of it, and not be a part of the universal church. The local church is a manifestation of something which is much bigger than itself. So I'm just describing two different layers that we could look at the church. Today, I want to talk about different characteristics of what makes a church. So I've been in church on a lot of different levels. I was a church planter. So when the church was little, it was just me and my wife and my two daughters, our two daughters. As the church grew, then we, we brought people into the membership. We had more leaders, more people involved. So I've seen it really small. I've seen it grow. I've seen it medium. I've seen it large. I've seen it go through building projects. We started another church, a Korean church, and then we started another church in Allentown, and we merged two churches together. I feel like I've seen church at a lot of different levels. One other experience that I've had is that I went to China and taught pastors in the underground church three different times. So for three different summers, I went over there to train them. And the way they have to do church by default is they have to do house churches because you can't gather in larger groups. Now, it is true there are some larger churches over there. So everything you've heard about China is probably true somewhere. In the larger international cities, they do have some larger churches. But as you get more rural and as you get deeper into China, there's much less and the churches have to become secretive. And so how they did church there was very different than how we would do it here by necessity. And so I've seen church at a lot of different levels, but there's these few things that I believe are markers of what a true church is, if you want to call it a church. And the first essential element of the church, and by the way, I'm going to be in Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. That's where I'm going to be camping out for the most part here. I might go to one or two other passages, but for the most part, I'm going to stay there. In Acts chapter 2, what we see is the birth of the church. So Acts starts out, Jesus is still on the earth and he's sending the disciples out. He says, don't stand here, go, be obedient, go back to Galilee, wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit, or don't go back to Galilee, stop going back, wait here. Jesus ascends, the angel comes and says, why do you stand here staring, uh, go and do what he told you to do. And Jesus said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to baptize you pretty, pretty soon. You're going to be baptized with the Spirit and with fire indicating that the Holy Spirit would be coming upon them, and that happened on the day of Pentecost, and that those who did not receive the Spirit or who would not during their life would one day be baptized by fire. Now, there was an anointing with a flame of fire when the Spirit came, but I don't believe that's what this is talking about. I think this is talking about blessing or judgment because of having the Holy Spirit or not having the Holy Spirit. Then he says, I want you, when you receive the Holy Spirit, here's what you're supposed to do with that power. When you receive the Spirit, you shall be witnesses to me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. This is in Acts chapter 1. As we work our way through Acts, we see that they're waiting for the coming of the Spirit. The day of Pentecost comes, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and then we see the formation of the church. In Acts chapter 2, we see Peter preaching to the people that were there. When we get to verses 41 and fo through 47, we see the formation of the very first church. By the way, all of church history goes back to this. This wasn't the first Baptist church, and it wasn't the first Roman Catholic church. It wasn't the first Greek Orthodox church. It was the first church of God, amen? It was God's church, and it was born that day. Out of that church... A number of things happened. I'm going to read Acts chapter 2, 41 through 47. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Here we have the first description of the very first church which ever existed on the face of the earth. It was the church at Jerusalem. 
And so the first element that I want to look at, there's elements of what this church is, and we can see from the passage, the first one is that they're a group of believers. When I studied about church history and about churches, there was this one thing that was unique to churches like ours, and that is that we believe in a regenerated membership. In other words, if you want to be a member here, we accept you into the membership on this base level that you're confessing the name of Christ. Now we ask, will you support our constitution and our doctrinal statement? But a lot of people might not even understand that. But what we do want to know, if you're going to be a member here, is have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you been born again? And so the first thing that we see, if you're going to be a part of a real church, is that you're a believer, that you're saved. Now you can belong to a church. You could come here. You could even probably join. If we didn't know you weren't saved, you might be able to join the church, but that doesn't make you a real part of the real church of God. You want to be a real church, and it involves a local group of believers. And so we've got believers from this area that come together. We're not the only church around. We're not the only church that preaches the gospel. We're, not, we're one of the many in Lancaster County that's preaching the gospel. Amen. God has really blessed our area. But you know what? There's a lot more out there that need to hear. There's a lot that need to hear. And a lot right here in this town, in Central Manor, we need to give out the gospel. But this is something we're doing locally. We started a church, as I said, in Allentown. And it was as we were starting the church that we knew, we, we had identified the fact there was a couple of large churches there. And I, I'm not opposed to the large churches at all. But my point that I'm making is that a lot of the large churches had people coming in from out of town, and a lot of the people on the streets were not getting reached. And so what we did was we wanted to work with those churches, the larger and smaller ones, and just say, hey, we want to reach the people in East Allentown. And so we did that. We began to reach them because I believe churches ought to make a difference where they're at. You should be a part of the community. You shouldn't be an anomaly within a community. You're just there, and nobody knows you're there, or they know you're there, but you're the church that doesn't care. No, we want to be the church that cares, the church that's a part of our community. And so we're a local group of believers gathered together. We're not all the same. Conformity is not what we're looking for. We're looking for unity. Unity is beautiful only if we're all different. It's not beautiful if we're forcing conformity where we all have to look the same, act the same, and smell the same. We're not looking for that. We're looking for a local group of believers that want to gather together. In the Bible, here's some passages. You can jot these down. I'm not reading the whole verses. I'm just referencing those. Acts chapter 11 and verse 22 refers to the church in Jerusalem. And By the way, that was a grouping of churches as well as individual churches. 1 Corinthians 1-2 refers to the church of God at Corinth. 1 Thessalonians is addressed in chapter 1 and verse 1 as the church of the Thessalonians. And it goes on throughout the Bible in this way. I had one professor say to me that I think the proper name for a church would be the church in Central Manor. You know, without all the baggage of these titles, which lose meaning over time, just the church in Central Manor. Well, that would be good unless everybody else called themselves that, then we wouldn't know the difference, would we? goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 16, 19, the churches of Asia, Asia send greetings. Aquila and Priscilla, together with the church in their house, send you a hearty greeting in the Lord. Colossians 4, 15, to Nympha and the church in her house. And Paul's letter to Philemon, to the church in your house. And it's not that every church had to be in houses, but that was the early church. When Lisa and I started church 24 years ago, we met in a bank. Actually, the first time we met, we were a church. We met together. We met in a trailer. And the lady who hosted that meeting is still a dear friend. And every time we see each other, we laugh about it. But uh, I showed up on the wrong day, and so did everybody else. And uh, she came out in this big purple bathrobe. <laughs> and uh, we went in her trailer. She said, give me five minutes. So five minutes. That was our very first church service. And uh, she whipped things together and we went in and had church that day. You don't need a church building. Amen. You don't need air conditioning systems. You don't need any of this. 
It is the people of God which constitute the church of God in a local place. And so it is the church that is in an area. We believe in local churches. We also believe in the universal church or what would be better understood as the spiritual church, those who are Christians and believers. The second mark, essential mark of a true church is this. They, they met regularly. In the Bible, they began to meet on the Lord's day, which was not the Sabbath. By the way, would it shake you for me to say that it was in the New Testament times that they worked on Sunday, like every Sunday, because it was the Sabbath day they took off and they began to worship God on Sunday. And so it was Sunday. It was likely, here's how I picture it, a full day of work. They're all hot. They're washing up. They're getting the kids ready. They're getting some food. And they went to somebody's house and had a meal and worshiped God together. And that, that last sentence is for those of you who think we shouldn't have coffee and food in church. Because I'm telling you, they had coffee and food. Man, not coffee. They had food in church. They had fellowship in church. They had sweet times of fellowship in church. Doesn't that sound refreshing? It wasn't until Constantine that Sunday became the day of rest. And that was the basis for all of our blue light laws and all of that. And I'm not trying to take away Sunday as a day of rest because there is a Sabbath principle throughout all of the Bible. It says you work six days and you take one day off, right? And so we're to take one day of rest. By the way, probably the biggest offenders today are the young parents who have their children in something seven days a week. We're, we're refusing to acknowledge the authority of God in our lives. There's got to be a day of rest. We should do it. Even if we don't think we need it, do it because we're being obedient to God. In Acts chapter 2, talks about the fact that they met regularly. And they were devoted to preaching and teaching. And verse 46, and day by day attending the temple together. And so they weren't meeting in houses here. They were using the temple until they got kicked out of the temple. And even Paul, he tried meeting in the synagogues until the synagogue rulers kicked him out. And so they stopped meeting in synagogues. So it's not an essential that you meet in a house. Some have thought, well, it's the most pure form of church. It can be if that's what God wants you to do. But what a beautiful thing it is when we all come together with our combined gifts and resources, with our fellowship, our ability to minister, our opportunity to grow in the Lord in this way with qualified leaders, with, with a focus, with a mission. It's a beautiful thing that a church would grow beyond the walls of a house church. I'm not opposed to house churches. We were once one, and I love those times. But there's no more virtue in a house church than there is in a church that met in a trailer or one that met in a bank, which, by the way, we met in a bank for 10 years and didn't get any money out of the deal. But it was fun. By the way, God blessed greatly there. So they met regularly. The Bible tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It doesn't say be in church every time the doors are open and volunteer for everything. Uh, or if you're on vacation, make sure you go to church or you're in sin. Um, no, it's just saying don't forsake the assembling doesn't mean you forsook it because you missed a Sunday or because you didn't do every time the doors were open. Listen, we need to provide opportunities for people to serve and to minister and be ministered to. That doesn't mean you can take advantage of all of them. Just the ones where you need to be ministered to or where someone else needs you to minister to them. And so they met regularly. The third thing is that there was an accepted doctrine. Acts 2.42 talks about meeting together under the apostles' teachings. So this wasn't something that they, they imagined up or every week, let's, you know, what's the liturgy that the denomination can send us? They were teaching the teachings that the apostles gave. And the apostles were, were giving the word of God. It was meant to be circulated. Think of the apostle Paul who wrote, or actually John, who wrote to the, to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, that letter was meant to be circulated. Paul's writings were meant to be circulated. The word of God was, was circulating around and people were studying it and were, and were growing from it. The apostles' teachings were what they were basing, what they were learning in the churches on. It was the teachings of the apostle, apostles. Verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And so there is an accepted doctrine. We have an accepted doctrine here. 
Though I suppose if we would say, you can believe whatever you want and come here to church, it might be more attractive to some people. Um, but I say that's a mistake. To fall into the patterns of what we see for the early church, there was an accepted doctrine. I heard one girl say, well, I really love my church because you can believe anything you want and be a member here. Well, that's a tragedy. That is a tragedy. I think we ought to gather around the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. There is an accepted doctrine. When we join the church, we say, I agree to support this doctrine, these teachings. Now, outside of those teachings, there's a lot of things that we could talk about. We could debate them even. But uh, it's the essentials we're looking at when we ask people to commit to our church. We have an accepted doctrine. The fourth one is this, leadership. And not just leadership, but qualified leadership. So you want to start a church, you need to have some qualified leaders to be involved in that church. Actually, you could start a church, but pray that God would bring someone along if you're not the qualified one. But the Bible speaks of qualified leaders, and it speaks of it in a very serious fashion. I mean, we're not talking about just sitting around a coffee table every week having coffee and this is church. It's not really a church in the way that Bible des- describes it if you don't have a qualified leadership. I'm not saying you're not a church at all. Lisa and I had very little when we started. It was just me. As you grow, you take on these elements, but a qualified leadership. We read through some of these verses about the leaders of the church, about the pastors, the elders. We believe here that the elders are pastors, pastors are elders, that the difference is, is, is one gets paid and the others don't, right? Uh, several of us get paid and the others don't. I don't think you get a check, do you, Dan, in the mail every month? Um, and I have a job description, which is much more detailed. I have a different responsibility. So Dan's not responsible to preach. He's not responsible to set the order of worship. He's not responsible to do the different things during the week to oversee the staff. But when we get together, even though our responsibilities might be different, we all have an equal say. The pastor, the elders, all of us together, the same say. And so it's a qualified leadership. Not only do I believe in qualified elders, but I believe in qualified elders and a multiplicity of elders. Some small churches only have one because that's all you have. But I believe as you grow, you ought to have a multiplicity of leaders within the church, of qualified people that are able to lead, make decisions, and set the pace. And so there's a multiplicity. There's also the multiplicity of elders, those people ser- or deacons, those people who serve in the church. So in Acts chapter 6, the Greek families, they had family members that were being neglected, while the Jewish families were all taken care of. So a complaint rose up. The apostles got together and said, listen, we can't take time to serve meals to all of these widows. And so let's get some people to appoint to that task so that the apostles can do their work. What I'm saying to you is that deacons serve the elders by doing the work of the people so that the elders can be in prayer, can be in study of the word of God and who can minister to people. Now, it's not the job description of the pastor to to clean the toilets and fix the walls. No, I do that as a member of this church. That's my responsibility as a member, but I don't do that as part of my job description. You see, the deacon should be taking care of that. It says explicitly in our Constitution, the deacons are in charge of the material and financial aspects of running the church. And so it frees the pastor up. It frees the elders up so that we can be praying for you so that we can be studying the Word, so that we can be teaching and preaching. And so the, the presence of deacons and other leaders as well. Fifthly, there's financial support. If you're a true church, 1 Timothy 5 talks about the widows supporting them. Why don't we support more widows here? Because more and more widows have their own retirement or have Social Security or have family that can take care of them. But 1 Timothy 5 talked about supporting widows, and it talks about who's a widow indeed. Like, who are the widows that need to be receiving money from the church? They were ones that didn't have family. So if you got family, let your family take care of you. You had to be a certain age, 55 or older. You had to have proven yourself by being faithful in the church and not a slanderer. If you were that kind of person, then the church shouldn't have supported you. All I'm saying is that in 1 Timothy 5, the church had financial obligations. That money comes from the free will offerings of those people who come to church. Not only that, there was support of missions. The Apostle Paul 
supported by missions money, and then the support of the pastor. 1 Corinthians 9 is like a whole chapter talking about, listen, pay the pastor, take care of him. And Paul says, I didn't receive pay because I chose not to, but it wasn't the church's choice or freedom not to pay a guy. They had the obligation to pay him. And so if you're interested, read through that. I don't bring that up because it's budget season at all. Uh, and by the way, the church pays me well, so it has nothing to do with that. I'm just saying we use the money for ministry. Statistically, the pastors are the largest portion of the budget in the church. More than 50% of the budget in most churches goes to the support of the pastor or the full-time staff or part-time staff. And so it is a large portion of that, but an essential part of doing church, especially as churches grow. And so you have these financial obligations. Next, it's a place to use your gifts. We re read through 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 14. So we come together so we can edify one another. I've had people say to me, well, why do we do all these things that we do? We should just get rid of all the events. If I get rid of all the events and I lose the opportunity to let you minister, we talked about this week, wouldn't it be nice when we design our landscaping to have some people do some of that instead of having it done, everything done by professionals. Now we can do this. Man, I want to do it. Let me add it. Probably shouldn't let me, but I would love to do this. And there's some of you that could do this with your eyes closed. And if we take away every ministry for you guys, then there's no way for you to ser serve or use your gifts or to edify one another as the Bible describes. We should be using our gifts, whether it's speaking, helping, teaching, or serving, whatever it may be, to use our gifts in those ways. Number seven is prayers together. They got together and prayed. I actually did have somebody say to me, why do you pray so long before church? You know, we, we're doing too many prayers. Like, oh, this is where we pray. We ought to be praying more, not less. We ought to have people of prayer. By the way, sign up for the prayer meetings in the lobby. Another shameless push. Next was the preaching and teaching. Verse 42, they gathered to hear the uh, preaching and teaching of the apostles' doctrine. And then 242 the, uh, shows the ordinances, number nine the practice of the ordinances, which I preached about last week. So here's my definition. If you took all of those lines and add them up, there's my working definition of what's a church. A local church is ga a gathered group of believers in a particular location that meets regularly, has an accepted doctrine and practice, qualified leaders leading them, supports ministry with finances and material support, uses combined gifts to minister, they pray together, there's preaching and teaching, and they practice the ordinance. So, my simple question is the church for today, or what's the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of the church? So we would say, now I know not many people knew this verse in the first service. So if you know this verse, say it with me. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Try it again with me. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So we would say the purpose of the church is to glorify God. How do we glorify God? I'll say it simply. We disciple our world for Christ. We disciple our world for Christ. Discipleship means we give out the gospel and see people get saved. Discipleship means that we're helping people to grow in the Lord by learning and serving and getting all that they need in order to do ministry. Here's the five goals that I have set as a pastor, and you can find these all in Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. I believe the purpose of the church is to meet together for the purpose of outreach, fellowship, well, maybe I have those out of order, worship, training, and ministry. So we reach out to the lost and to the unchurched. We fellowship. Haven't we lost some of that these days? My family used to get in the car and just go and say, let's drive around and see who will grace with our presence tonight. They didn't say it that way, but they're like, let's go see who to visit. So all seven Davises would just show up at somebody's door. <laughs> it was awesome. I love to see the look on their face. Uh, but we did those things back then. We had people just stop in. They used to just stop in. I think we've lost the art of fellowship. Where I grew up at church, I worked with the farmers all week long. 
and then would come to church with the same farmers. I knew these guys. We would tell jokes. We would laugh. They're still some of my dearest friends. I knew the people at church. What a tragedy it is when we don't know each other. What a tragedy it is when we don't get to know people older than us and younger than us and make them good friends. We ought to be doing these things, making it happen casually, doing it deliberately, outreach, worship, fellowship, training. I want to do more training. It's one of my goals. I started it. I backed off. We'll have to see how it works out. But I think that I would like to to train people to be ministers here more effectively. I'd like to do a New Testament survey, Old Testament survey. I'd like to do a Bible doctrines. I'd like to do a hermeneutics. I'd like to do homiletics, teach you how to speak to people, how to form devotionals, how to, how to do a sermon, how to preach. We got more and more of our people here at church preaching. We have our elders preaching. We have other people preaching. I don't want to give up my pulpit too much. I just want to say this, that as I equip you, then you can do more ministry. I want to teach you how to teach. I want to teach you how to minister to kids. I want to teach you how to lead a soul to the Lord. How do you witness to children? And so I think training should be taking place. And then lastly, we all minister. In what ways can we minister? All of us are different from one another. So is the church for today? My answer is an unequivocal yes. The church is for today. I believe that the church is God's idea for bringing believers together to use their Combined commitment, resources, and gifting for the furthering of the mission that God has given us to disciple our world for Jesus. I believe that a strong church functioning in the ways that God has prescribed in His Word will be a beacon to the community it resides in. We need to make a difference in Central Manor. Amen? And we are that light. We have the light. Let's be the light. So I envision a church that's increasingly accessible to our community. Not in the sense that they can come in any time of the day and night and raid the refrigerator, but in the sense that they can actually get in the front door and sit here in this sanctuary and and be able to worship God with us. I want accessibility. I want visibility. I want usability of all of our rooms. I want adaptability. That's my vision as a pastor so that we can increasingly be interfacing with with the community around us. I envision that. I want to be that kind of church. I envision a ministry that's growing. We got to continue to look ahead. And what can we do now in order to lay the foundation for the future? What's my generation going to leave for the next generation and the next generation? I want to leave a lasting place of worshiping and serving God. I envision the attendance growing. I know we got a lot of people missing today, but it's still good attendance. Listen, for the summer, we had... Nearly 350 people last week. That was in the dead of summer. Praise God for that. We've seen the numbers. They keep creeping up. And it's, listen, it's not about numbers in the sense that I want the church to be bigger and then we'll be successful. Small church was a lot of fun. But I'm telling you, if we're carrying out God's mission, we're going to grow. I want to bring people in for the sake of the kingdom. I want to edify people. I want to see people get saved. I don't want to stay what we once were, and I don't want to stay what we are now. I envision a church that's growing. I envision one day having new staff. I envision a church that stays real and relational and approachable, kind and gracious. I embrace and envision being relevant, and and with that comes kindness and graciousness. So a kind and gracious church. I envision unity, love, caring, knowing, serving, helping, learning, and equipping within this body. It should be a family place, a a place you could leave and move away to Arizona and come back 20 years from now and still feel at home when you come here. That's what I want for this place. In fact, that's what this place is to some degree. I want to continue to be that place. I want to be that place where you come here and you know that we're going to preach the Bible and that we believe the teachings of God's Word and that without apology and without compromise, we're going to proclaim God's truth. I want to be a place that maintains the mission of God, where God can be glorified, people discipled, and that the mission of God would move forward for many, many, many years to come. So, I want you to feel your age. Next year, in August, we turn 125. How does that make you feel? It's like, wow, what? 125 our church is. I know most of you aren't that age, actually. There's 
a few that I think might be approaching it. But 125 years old. So we look back at the past, and we should celebrate in what God has done, right? He's done a great work. Lives have been changed. People could stand up here and tell you when they got saved and where they got saved. They can tell you where they committed their lives to, to serve God. They can tell you um, where major incidents happened within the church that were for the sake of the, the mission of God. But I want to use all of that past to motivate us for the future. That we've got, we've got things that God wants us to accomplish. Are we on it? Are we that church? The church of God, arise. Stand up, O church of God. To be the light to the world that we're meant to be. And to be involved in the ways that God has called us to. So the last thing I have for you is a bookmarker in your bulletin. I printed these up. And some of you will say, I didn't, I didn't know we had a church covenant. And we do. It's not something you got to sign in order to be a part here. But it is something that uh, we, we read in front of the church when new members join. And here's how it reads. Having received Christ as my Lord and Savior and been baptized and being in agreement with Central Manor's statement, strategy, and structure, I now feel led by the Holy Spirit to unite with the Central Manor church family. In doing so, I commit, my, uh, I commit myself to God and to the other members to do the following. I will protect the unity of my church. How do you talk about your church? How do you talk about its leaders? How do you talk about your friends, other people outside of our church? It says, I will protect the unity of my church by acting in love towards other members, by refusing to gossip, and by following the leaders. Secondly, I will share the responsibility of my church. Again, that's church isn't to be done by professionals. This is our church. It's our church. And we need to do it together. And so we'll do it by praying for its growth, by inviting the unchurched to attend, by warmly welcoming those who visit. Thirdly, I will serve the ministry of my church by discovering my gifts and talents, by being equipped to serve by my pastors, and by developing a servant's heart. And then lastly, I will support the testimony of my church by attending faithfully, by living a godly life, and by giving regularly. Listen, the church is God's idea. Let us stay behind it. Let us support it and let us be a light to the world around us.